Hey, Clarence. How's it going? Hey, Andy. Yeah, I'm a little stressed, man. The light board is having some glitches, and I had one of my musicians cancel this morning, and I'm trying to get these arrangements done by this weekend. Oh, that reminds me. I need you to write a song for my message this weekend, and it needs to be good. Remember, God never gives us more than we can handle. <laughs> and done. Ah! I just lost all those files. Well, you know, everything happens for a reason. Uh, a little help, Andy? Uh, God helps those who help themselves, Clarence. <coughs> when God closes a door, well, he opens a window. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> well, we are in this series, That's So Cliche, week two, and we're looking at Christian statements that we say, that we use, that we usually mean to be helpful. It's something that maybe somebody taught, told us, or somehow we picked it up, and we're usually using it to maybe bring comfort and understanding or something like that, and and. What happens, though, is sometimes it does the opposite. It does not really bring the comfort. We, last week, we looked at uh, everything happens for a reason, and, and we looked at really the, what's behind that statement is, is that in this, particularly in the word everything, it means that even bad things, uh, bad things that happen to people, usually that's when you're trying to give counsel or comfort or encouragement. And when, you, when we use that phrase, what we're implying is that God is behind that. that. That bad thing happened was because God kind of intended that to happen, that you don't see it yet. Uh, it'll become clear maybe sometime at a later point. Uh, but that bad thing happened for a good reason. You just don't, you, don't, you don't know what that is yet. And unfortunately, when we're in a place of pain, something that's difficult has happened to us, it's God who we need comfort from. And that statement really just drives a wedge between us and God because he's kind of the one who, who did it to us, you know, if we really think about that phrase. So what we're talking about with these cliches is we're saying, let's really evaluate them and say, you know, or put them up against Scripture. Is this, is this something we want to say or is this something that maybe we should not keep repeating because it's just, it's not making things better, maybe making things worse. And so today we're going to be looking at another phrase. And this phrase I have uh, uh, up on uh, the billboard there. You can, we'll read it together. It's scratched out the middle line, but we'll read it anyways. Okay, let's read it out loud together. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Now the verse they have there, uh, 2 Timothy 2.13, actually has nothing to do with that verse. I'm not sure why they put that there. But but that's a common phrase. And then sometimes there's a follow-up phrase that people will say, this is God said it. And they'll say, that settles it, whether I believe it or not. And like this bumper sticker that you can buy off online. You know, it doesn't really matter what I believe. Now, what is being communicated with this statement? Well, what they're saying is that they're basically saying God said it. And what that means is they're referring to the Bible. They're saying the Bible said this. And I believe God wrote the Bible, and I believe in God, and so I believe what is being stated, no matter what our culture says. That's a good thing to say, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But the problem is, that is an oversimplistic view of how we go about interpreting the Bible. Uh, if, if this just, it just doesn't work like that. So we're going to look a little bit at that tonight, about how to go about uh, interpreting the Bible so that that when we communicate, we really realize this is what God said. And then we do believe it. And it really, it, the, it, the whole settling, it sounds kind of militant to me. I mean, it, it sounds like that's end of discussion, right? So we don't really use that phrase around here because we don't really have that value. We don't go around just uh, preaching at people at the workplace and saying that's, you know, that's the end of discussion. On the contrary, we want to get involved in conversations. We think that's an important part of sharing our faith and understanding our culture and connecting with people that don't necessarily have the same experience or viewpoint as us. So 
conversation is very important. We invite that process. And so this, this cliche would kind of like end that, you know, let's not even discuss it. I'm right. You know, I mean, it feels good to say that, but unfortunately that's not the way it happens so many times. So we're going to look at that a little bit and uh, some guidelines in interpreting the Bible. Careful reading of the Bible, notice in your outline, involves challenging verses. Sometimes there are verses that are more challenging than others. Uh, did you know that in the 19, uh, excuse me, in the 1880s, there was a, a verse that was very, very common that preachers used. They were preaching from it all the time out of Deuteronomy. Why in the 1880s, why preach from a particular verse? It's because indoor plumbing was becoming very, very popular in people's homes and in places like uh, churches. They were moving from outhouses in the 1880s and moving into uh, these uh, indoor plumbing and toilets in churches. And so there was a verse that spoke to this. I don't know if you've ever heard a sermon with this verse, but uh, uh, here's, uh, here's what it is. This was a very common verse at the day. People were talking about it all the time. It says, you shall, notice there in Deuteronomy 23, you shall have a designated area outside the camp to which you shall go. He's talking about going to the bathroom. With your utensils, you shall have a trowel. When you relieve yourself outside, you shall dig a hole with it and then cover up your excrement. Because the Lord your God travels along with your camp to save you and to hand you over to your enemies, therefore your camp must be holy so that he may not see anything indecent among you and turn away from you. Now you could imagine preachers using this verse to talk to their congregations about why indoor plumbing was wrong. I mean, they'd say, this, God doesn't want to see that indecent stuff that you do in the bathroom. And if, if, we, bring, if we shut down the outhouses and bring it into the church, that's, that's, God's going to turn away from us. The blessings that he wants to give us, he's going to withhold those blessings. He's going to turn his favor away, turn his face away. And uh, I mean, that's pretty strong preaching, right? But that was, and they said, because the church is the camp. That's where God resides. Now, in the last, there hasn't been a church in the last 75 years that's, that's made without bathrooms, right? When we did our renovations, one of the first questions was, how many bathrooms, how many toilets are we going to get? Nobody seems to be upset about toilets today. They've kind of figured all that out. But at the time, it was confusing. And they were going, should we have toilets in church or should we not have toilets in church? Fast forward 80 years, and there was an ethical crisis that was in regards to organ transplantation, specifically human heart transplants, open heart surgery. December 3rd, 1967, the cardiac surgeon Christian Bernard performed the very first human transplant on Luis Waskonski. Uh, it called into question a number of things. Number one is, what is the point that somebody actually dies? It's much like we saw with Terry Shriver about 10 years ago. You remember that down in Florida where she was brain dead and they were saying, could they pull the plug on her or not? And then were doctors trying to control nature? Beyond that, the Bible made a close link to, from the, of the heart to the spirit. They, they, were, they were understood as being synonymous. You take somebody's heart out, that's their spirit. You don't cut it out and put it in somebody else. Says, for example, they looked at verses like this: "Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me." See, you have this connection. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Don't cut it out. You guard it. You protect it. Many pastors taught that organ transplantation was a violation of um, of the way you're supposed to treat your body for the resurrection. That if you showed up at the resurrection without a heart, because you gave it to somebody else, you'd be you'd be in eternity without a heart. It doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Otherwise, John, Bath John the Baptist would be headless in heaven, right? <laughs> but at the time, it was confusing. And they thought, well, should you do it? Should you not? When it comes to the issue of life-sustaining measures on people that are very, very ill, I've been involved in a number of them where people call me into the hospital and they, they're, they're, their family members are gathered around and they're wondering, do we pull the plug? Do we don't? Uh, do, should we not? I was, we had a vineyard pastor, his wife, uh, had a had uh, an aneurysm uh, and a stroke and anyway she was basically considered brain dead the ch whole church it was here in Chesapeake the whole church was praying that she would recover 
And people were kind of, some people were really sensing that's what God was going to do. And, and they were fasting, singing. Every time I'd go to the hospital, they, the, the whole hospital was filled with songs and hymns and they're praying. And the doctors are saying, well, if we don't take the organs now, they'll be worthless. And she signed, she's an organ donor and she's brain dead. Put in an enormous quandary. It's very, very difficult. Sometimes there's confusing things when, when you're looking at tough issues, ethical issues like that. So I'm not, I, I understand. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not, I'm not giving you the answers tonight. I'm just saying it's complicated sometimes. Sometimes it is challenging. And we have to recognize that. So careful reading the Bible involves that. It also involves not taking verses out of context. Now, taking verses out of context is commonly referred to as proof texting. You have an agenda, you want something, and so you go looking for the Bible for it. And you, hey, look at this, this will work. And then it kind of like excuses your behavior. You know, you just, I want to do this anyways. So I got to try to find a verse, <laughs> right? That's, that's, that can happen. Where you just lift things out of context that, do, that, that, that it, has, it does not mean that. Imagine somebody going through the Bible and they think, well, I'm just going to let the Bible speak to me today. And so they go to Matthew 27, 5, where it says Judas hanged himself. They go, wow, what does that mean? And so they flip again, and they come across Luke 10, 37, where it says, go and do likewise. <laughs> they go, wow, is this God speaking to me? Well, I better look one more verse. So they go to another verse, and they come to John 13, 27, where it, where it says, what you're about to do, do quickly. <laughs> you could end up kind of going in a wild direction, right? Now, that's crazy, right? Somebody might not do that, but they do do that kind of stuff. They pull stuff out of context. Let me give you some examples. Over the years, uh, there was um, back, especially during the Puritan days uh, of the 16th, 17th century in America, uh, they often would not wear jewelry. They didn't believe in jewelry. Why? Well, this verse here, Paul wrote to First Timothy, in Timothy, 1 Timothy 2.9, he said, women should dress themselves modestly and de decently in suitable clothing, not with Hair, their hair braided or with gold, pearls, or expensive clothes. Now, obviously, braiding your hair today is different than what it meant there. There's a context that's going on to it. And he's, he's saying he, he doesn't want the church, the worship service, to be, uh, you know, like the Oscars, where who can dress the best. But the, really the point he's making is, is about where beauty comes from. You know, we're, we're our beauty as Christ followers, our genuine beauty is what Christ is doing inside us, our character. Not that we ignore the outside, but that's where it really happens. And so this is what he's saying. And if you read that passage and you get kind of what Paul's communicating there, you get that. But if you just pull that out of there and you look at it, you can end up like the Puritans and say, well, I want to do what God says. God said it. You know, whether I believe it or not, and I do believe it, and so that settles it. I, I just can't wear, and so th they wouldn't wear wedding bands and, and uh, any kind of jewelry, no gold, none, none of that stuff. He's saying it's more than accessories. He's saying beauty comes from the heart, but that's pulling it out of context. Fast forward 200 years. Bible was frequently taken out of context in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s by Southern preachers when they argued that slavery was the social order that God had designed. Owning slaves was what they were trying to uh, say was okay. Some people say, well, that was the good kind of slavery. I'm not sure that was, I don't think any kind of slavery is good. Saying it's, it's, but, but this would be a, a one of the verses, and they misquoted Jesus. If you read that, it has nothing to do with, he's telling a story about something. He's not, he's not endorsing it, but they would misquote it. And they would say this verse here, uh, and the servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. If you saw the 12 years of slave, you see the wicked slave master quoting this verse, threatening and intimidating the slaves that he owned which happened all the time. They would use a verse like this and then they would justify the reason why they could, they would not only uh, keep the slavery going on, but also with their abuse that went often with it. And so that's, that was another way that uh, verses were proof text or pulled out of context. Another one, not maybe as severe as that, but very common today, modern day, is justifying smoking marijuana recreational marijuana. 
and people look for verses for that. Now, of course, today you have Washington State, Colorado, there's some counties in, in California, and it's only a matter of time until it spreads throughout the United States where smoking pot, selling pot is legal. And so there's many, many Christians that think, oh, it's okay to do pot because it's legal now. And if you're in a state, and so it's not okay here because it's not legal yet, but once it's legal in Virginia, it'll be okay. And they'll quote a verse like this where it says, for the Lord's sake, obey every law of the government. In other words, obey the laws of the land. And so what they're saying is, is I'm going to base my morality, my biblical morality on whatever the laws of the land say. But abortion is legal. And that, I don't think that's a moral thing. There's a number of laws. Why would we just use the laws of the land? It's one thing to obey them, but that's not where we derive our, our, uh, our morality. Our morality comes from what God says. And so getting stoned, getting high, you know, that's, that's not God's best. Some people say, well, where does it say uh, that it's wrong to smoke pot in the Bible? Well, it doesn't say it. It doesn't say that it's wrong to shoot heroin either. And there's some things that the Bible doesn't speak to, but it does talk a lot about being sober-minded, about being, having a clear head all the time. And, and when you smoke, see, if you take two sips of wine, it tastes good. Two hits from a joint, and you're starting the process of intoxication because that THC immediately gets into you. And you say, well, Andy, how do you really know this? Well, <laughs> I wish I didn't know it. I wish I didn't. I started smoking pot when I was in seventh grade. It was just the environment I grew up in, you know, for good, for bad, whatever. I mean, you know, it's just that's, you know, I'm not saying I'm a total victim, but everybody I knew, my, my, including my dad and my, my brothers, my older brothers, everybody smoked pot. So I just started smoking pot and, and did it all the time, fully involved in it at every level. Just use your imagination. That's how involved I was. Smoke. And I came to Christ when I was 18. I still smoke pot for another. I smoked pot the night I accepted Christ. <laughs> I said, I told my brother, he led me to Jesus. I said, what now? He goes, now we smoke pot and we don't feel guilty about it. I said, that sounds awesome. <laughs> and so we smoked pot and did some coke. And, and I continued to do drugs for, for about a year until I, and I kept, I'd find verses and I think, ah, this doesn't sound like maybe I should be doing it. And of course, the Holy Spirit's working on me as well. And I justified it. And finally, after about a year, I realized, you know what? This isn't God's best for me. The truth is, recreational marijuana is wrong. And I have no business doing it. If I'm going to want to be hearing from God and, and letting the Holy Spirit guide me. And so I know that we did a survey on this particular topic. A lot of you took the survey. And I know where a lot of the church stands here. And to tell you the truth, I, it's about 50-50. 50% of Vineyard Community Church thinks it's okay to smoke pot as a Christian, as a Christian, if it's legal. And I'm telling you, I think that's wrong. Yeah. I do. And I don't want to make you feel bad. And if you're, if you, you, probably, you might have a, a dime bag at home and think he wants me to throw it out. <laughs> I know where he's going with this. <laughs> I do. I don't think it's God's best for you. But I'm not going to make you feel bad and, and feel guilty, but don't try to use verses to justify it either. Okay, because that's just pulling it out of context. So careful reading of the Bible involves challenging verses. It involves not taking verses out of context. Third, it's honoring current scholarship. That's part of what it means. There's people that have given their lives, like Graham 12 Tree. We're so blessed to have him, but he's a, he's a, a theologian. That's what he does. And he's given his life to study the scriptures and study the ancient manuscripts. And uh, he's told me about it. He actually has flown to some of these places where they keep the manuscripts in a vault. He has to come in with all his plastic stuff on his hands. And he goes, and he, and he goes to the original manuscripts and works with them. And these people, they love Jesus. And so we, we want to honor what they, what, what, how they help us uh, understand scripture. Now, let me give you a couple examples. One is, is that... Uh, as Graham pointed out two, two weeks ago, that we have no original manuscripts of the Bible. No original manuscripts. They're all copies. Some of them are early, early copies, but they're all copies. And so part of the process of looking at the copies of, of scriptures is looking at them and, 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 and comparing them and trying to get the most accurate. This is really the, what the original copy said. 
And so we want to defer to the earliest manuscripts. That's one of them. Defer to the earliest manuscripts. Let me give you an example. If you look in John chapter 5, Jesus is, um, is, goes into this place called Bethesda. It's a, it's, a heal, it's a pool where there's people believe that healing took place. Uh, and there was a man who had been lame for 38 years, was, was not healed. And other people, he would, you know, would evidently get healed, but he was not. Jesus came up to this man and he talked to him and he ended up healing this guy, picked up his mat, walked away. It was on a Sabbath and some great, it's just an amazing miracle. But if you look in John 5, there's a part there in verse 4 that is actually not in your Bible. If you open up your Bible now, you will not find verse 4. It'll go from verse 3 and skip right to verse 5, unless you have a King James Version. If you have a version 400 years old or older, you're good to go. You got this verse. But any of the current translators would not put this in here. And here's the verse. It says, from time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease he had. You say, well, why did uh, somebody put that in there? Well, to bring greater clarity, certainly it's not needed to understand the story. And it, it does not change the text by any, at all. It doesn't change. That's, he's just, this person was early on, understood what was going on. Maybe it was a tradition that was passed on. And he thought, well, I'm going to bring some clarity to that. But that verse is not in the original manuscript, not in the, the earliest copies. It was added much later on. So uh, I would not suggest you memorize this verse. This is not the verse you want to, you know, put to memory because it's, it's not even in your Bible. So we, that's just one example of how we defer to an honor. We honor the, uh, the, the, uh, the people that the scholars that have worked with us. Okay, here's another example. Women's roles in the church. Now, among the most interesting and seemingly anachronistic verses in the New Testament are those that relate to the women in the church, such as these two here in uh, 1 Corinthians. I mean, 1 Corinthians and then uh, 1 Timothy. 1 Corinthians 14 says this, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are, submit, they are to be submissive, as the law states, or says, excuse me. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. And then possibly an even more uncomfortable verse, if there's such one, would be here in 1 Timothy, where it says, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was, first, was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Now, it's obvious when I read these verses that Paul was not married. Because <laughs> I couldn't imagine how he was married and he would write this. I mean, right? But there's more to it than that. If you just read this, and this people have just read that, and they don't really defer to scholarship. And so they, with, with, uh, with uh, a, a good intentions, there's churches all over America right? Really all over the world, but all over America where women are not allowed to, to lead. They're not allowed to be on a board. They're not allowed to have any kind of leadership at all. They're, they're, they're not allowed to preach, of course. They're not allowed to read public scripture. And when you look at it, uh, they'll, they'll, say, they'll point to these verses. They'll say, well, it's real clear, just real clear. And if you read this, it does seem kind of clear, right? You go, well, how's Andy going to get out of this one? <laughs> well, I mean, what I did was this... Um, I just looked at the scholarship and said, you know, what are the scholars saying about these verses? Now, the first one is in 1 Corinthians 14, where he, if you read 1 Corinthians 14, uh, there's more to it than just this verse. Okay, it's, it's the whole chapter is about public worship service, about orderliness in public worship service. And the whole book, if you read all of 1 Corinthians, you see there was a lot of problems in the Corinthian church. There was a lot of disorderly behavior. It wasn't just the few things that he's addressing in chapter 14, but he's addressing it over and over. And the verse right before this verse in 1 Corinthians 14, he actually says, I want everybody, including women, I want everybody to pray and prophesy publicly. So why would he then the very next verse say, but you can't say anything? See, I mean, so early on, you're starting, if you start to look at it, you realize, well, what is Paul really trying to communicate? So 
The, uh, the worship service in Corinth, as I said, was chaotic and problematic. Paul is suggesting to quiet down, not really to be silent, because silent is a different Greek word. The word here is the word referring to being quiet. It's the same word when he says that men should eat in quiet, not in silence, but in quietness. Because men were getting very rowdy in their, in their eating. And so that's a different, a different book in Thessalonians. But he says, it's, but it's, the same, it's the, same, the same word there. He's talking about being quiet. In the synagogue, the Jewish synagogue, evidently in the early church, that women would often sit on one side of the church. Uh, the men would sit on the other side of the church. Or if they had a balcony, the women would be in the balcony. And in that day, women were very, very, un- they, they weren't learned. And so they would have to yell out, you know, either across the room and to get clarity. They didn't, most women didn't know how to read. Of course, only w- women only start to vote in our country just a few years, just uh, several decades ago, not that long ago, right? hundred years ago. So, I mean, we're talking about a culture that was very repressive. Paul is not supporting that culture. He's addressing a particular issue. And he's saying that, He's talking about uh, how to go about uh, women growing in their knowledge and communicating, which and he said, you know what, sometimes it's better it just be, you know, have a quiet attitude and ask those questions at home. Now, in, in 1 Timothy, he, Paul evidently is referring to here Adam and Eve. And you could even easily look at this and say, well, the woman is subordinate, is uh, submissive because they were the order of creation that Adam was created first, Eve was created second, and because of the order of creation that Eve is second. She's below Adam, and that's the way some people take that. But if you look at the, um, the, uh, the way it's actually said, it's talking about Adam being formed first, a different word than created. There's a number of times the, the, the Bible uses that word created. It's not used here. So again, that's honoring the scholarship, saying, okay, what word is actually being used? And, um, and so it's formed. And so he, what, what he, he's referring to is, is that the man was formed educationally and spiritually. He had uh, more time with God before the, he, the temptation happened with the, with, with, with the devil, with the serpent. And so he walked with God. He talked with God. There was this educational advantage. Again, women were, were, were not educated. And yet you had this flood of women that were coming in and helping to lead the churches. You had Phoebe, who was a strong leader, a pastor of a church. You had uh, you had Junius, who was a church planter, an apostle, going around starting churches. The ch- Bible, the New Testament particularly, has a lot of examples of women that were leaders in the church. So he's not saying you can't lead in the church, because why would he say that? And then all of these leaders that Paul is uh, endorsing and blessing. No, he's saying that, that there's a process that before you can publicly teach, that you need to be, you have to learn first. There's a, there's a, there's a, a, a process of... Uh, of uh, going through what Adam went through, where there's a formation that's ta- t- talking about. So he's not saying that, that, that because of the order of creation, that woman is below, but it's because of the way he had the advantage of being formed and having, uh, having knowledge, educational, spiritual advantage. He says women need to do that and go through that process as well. So instead of just reading these verses and saying, well, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. When we honor scholarship, we say, well, what, what really... It, you know, goes into this. You know, one of the first things when I, I told you I came to Christ when I was 18, my brother and I, we were slow learners, but I think around 19 or 20, he gave t- for, to me from Christmas a, a, uh, a concordance. And I said, what is a concordance? He goes, this is where you can look up individual words in the Bible and see what they mean. There's kind of deeper meaning behind some of these words. I said, really? And so he kind of showed me how to do it. And I've used it ever since. That's how I understand this. That's, you need that. So you might have a Bible app, and I'm thankful for that, and that's good for you, but I doubt you have a Bible concordance. And, uh, and if you do, I doubt you use it much, and you need one. So you, that's part of the tools of the trade to be a, a Christ follower who's not just going to say, well, the Bible says it, that settles it, I'm done, you know, end of discussion. No, there is a discussion. There is an understanding. There's walking into a new culture, something that we don't understand, a different language the Bible is written in. And say, God, the whole, and help me to understand this. I, I, you know, and you see God moving through the scriptures in a powerful way. And we don't want to get trapped 
and take things out of context and, uh, and, and, and oversimplify complicated verses and ignore scholarship. Well, let me give you two truths that are settled when it comes to the Bible. Two truths. Number one is the Bible transforms lives. The Bible transforms. Is that, is that number one or is that number two? I can't remember. Number one, you're helping me out. The Bible is inspired by God. Now, you already know number two. You can write it in. It transforms lives. And, and, and the, it's inspired by God. Acts 20, I love this, where Paul goes to the Ephesian church. He, he knows they'll never see him again. And he says this to me. He says, I have one thing I want to share with you. If you had one thing you wanted to share with somebody or a church, here's what he said. He says, I commit to you, God, and to the word of grace... He says, I'm leaving, but this is, I, I commit this, God's word to you, the word of grace. And he says this, which can build you up. He says, it can build you up. It can grow you spiritually. And he says, and I give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. What's that? Well, an inheritance is something that you get because you're part of the family, right? If, you, if Warren Buffett was, was in your family and he wrote a will and, and you were in it, that'd be good news, right? Unless you didn't know it. Unless you never read the will right? Then that wouldn't help you. If you didn't know that was available to you, all of the things that Warren Buffett had was available. And then if he died and you had no idea, you didn't take time, time to read it, it wouldn't help you. And God has way more than Warren Buffett in every way. And he has blessings and he has an inheritance for you when you put your faith in Christ. And he wants you to know it. And so the word of God is your inheritance. When you read it, you realize, oh, this is the things that God has, has blessed me with, wants me to have. And we step into that and you walk in that. 2 Timothy 3 says every scripture is inspired by God. There's the word inspired and is useful for, and notice he says four things, teaching, for showing mistakes, for correcting, and for training character so that the person who belongs to God can be equipped to do everything that is good. So he gives us these four things. He says, that, he says it, it helps us uh, understand God's word. You know, he says it for teaching but also for rebuking. Rebuking is when we fall off the path. He says, that's why you're off. And then correcting, he goes, this is how you get back on. And then training, this is how you stay on. You don't have to fall off again, right? Those are the four things. God's, God's word helps us to know when, we've, when we're in a ditch, why we got in the ditch, how we get out of the ditch, and how to stay out of the ditch. And that's what God says. He goes, I want you to understand my purpose for you. And the only way we can discover that is through his word. And then the second thing, as I said, it, the Bible transforms lives. It tr transforms people, our minds, transforms our thoughts, our, our, uh, it transforms our behavior, our character, everything that we do. If we allow God's presence and the word of God to come in, it completely changes things we want to do, but we can't do without his help. And it happens through his word. Notice in Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword that penetrates even the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So he says the word of God is actually alive. That word alive is the word living in Greek, zoe. It's where we get the word zoo, or of course the name zoe, zoology. It means to live. It says the word of God is alive. It's not just words, it's living. God uses it and breathes on it and causes us to change. And then it's also active. The Greek word there is energies. It's where we get our word energy. And it, in other words, there's not just, it's not just alive, but it has the power, the energy to change us. It says it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. He's saying that it's sh as sharp as like a surgeon's scalpel. It's not a chainsaw. It's not a skill saw. It's a scalpel. God comes in and uses the word of God to come and change us and cut away things that are harmful to us, just like a surgeon would do. Hey, that's not helpful for you. I'm going to cut that out. That's, that's a foreign body. That's not supposed to be there. It's not God's best for you. And he just cuts it out. And God's word does that. If we allow his word to soak into us and say, God, your presence, more of you, I want to be transformed. I want your inspired word to speak into my life. Okay, let's bow our heads and pray. Now I'm gonna invite the prayer teams to come forward. If you wanna come up and receive prayer, we'd love to have you receive prayer. Would you pray in your heart, say, God, I want your word 
to be the authority in my life. Do you pray that? I want your word to be the authority in my life. I don't always agree with it. I don't always like what it says. Certainly, it's not convenient. And it's not popular. Would you say, God, I know your word never lies. The truth never changes. And you know what you're talking about. You know what's best for me. So say, God, I want to accept your word. I want to learn from it. Then say, God, activate my faith as I study and read and learn from your word. Stimulate growth in my life. Help me to not shrink away from challenging verses. Help me not to just try to find convenient verses to support things I want to do, taking things out of context. I want to honor the hard work that Bible scholars do. You say, God, when I get down or when I get discouraged, feel like giving up, help me to turn to your word, not the TV, not some entertainment thing. Help me to turn to your word to elevate my mood to give me encouragement, to remind me of my inheritances and the promises and the hope that you give and that you have for me. Holy Spirit, you're a place of refuge, a quiet retreat where you can speak to us if we just let you. If you've never invited Christ into your life, why not do that? Say, Jesus Christ, come into my life. Point me in the right direction. I want to learn to love you and to trust you and to follow you. I need you in my life. You say, God, from this day forward, I'm not going to go my way. I'm going to go yours. And I want to be born again through the living word. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.